Uh, greetings. My name is uh, Raju. It's uh, today is a very special day in my life. Uh, I have the distinct honor of uh, interviewing Jerry Way. Uh, Dr. Jerry Way is on faculty at Mount Sinai in New York. He served as the president of American Society for GI Endoscopy, American College of Gastroenterology, and World Endoscopy Organization. Jerry trained literally hundreds of thousands of endoscopists all over the world, and some of them had the fortune of training him under his direct supervision. Others, like myself, were inspired by his teachings, and uh, I'm one of his biggest fans. Uh, typically, uh, Video GIE, as part of the master series, we request the master to identify his mentee, but uh, I have to uh, apologize to all the mentees who have gone through Jerry's hands for taking this opportunity because I'm one of his great fans and I wanted to do it myself. Uh, Jerry, thank you so much. I've learned a lot and I'm really honored to do this interview. And uh, the goal of this interview is to help endoscopists around the world learn about you, your career, your contributions to endoscopy, and your advice to future generations. So let's uh, start from your early childhood and influences that actually uh, made you take up this station of going into endoscopy. Thank you, Raju. Actually, I was born in Shanghai, China. My father was in the United States uh, from China doing a uh, advanced training in law at Harvard. During summer vacations, he sold wherever pots and pans, wherever aluminum pots and pans from door to door. And he was in this little hamlet in Illinois called Kankakee. He knocked on the door of my mother's house, and she was the only one at home at the time. She opened the door, and she saw this Chinaman there. Her mother always told her, Irene, if you're not a good girl, the Chinaman is going to come and get you. So he was at the door. They struck up a conversation. And within that summer, they eloped, got married. My father took her back to China, where she had four children. And he was a very successful maritime lawyer. When, as successful Chinese businessmen did at that time, he was going to take a concubine. That is, another woman who was going to live in the house, but not his wife. So my mother, who was a Midwestern Catholic girl, said, I'm out of here. So she came back to the United States, bringing four kids and... We ended up in Kankakee, Illinois, uh, until we moved to Trenton, New Jersey. And after Trenton, New Jersey, I went off to MIT to, um, to do my uh, college experience. MIT was an interesting place to be. Um, it was uh, the first time I was away from home. I had no idea what I was going to do uh, at MIT. and. MIT didn't have sufficient dormitory space to house all of the students at MIT. So they relied on fraternities, which were across the river. MIT's in Cambridge. There was just a long bridge that uh, went to Boston. And a lot of fraternities were on the other side of the bridge in the Boston area. So all the freshmen went from fraternity to fraternity to see if they wanted to join a fraternity for living so that they would decrease the burden of housing for MIT. So every fraternity that I went to suggested that I join the crew team. 
Now, I'd never heard of crew in my life. What's crew? <laughs> so they told me it was rowing, but I, was, I weighed 120 pounds, and as a freshman, I went off a crew. So it turns out that I uh, was on the crew team, and um, the uh, first year, we, um, we didn't have very many uh, races that we won. In fact, MIT uh, had the heavyweights. The year before I got there, had won their entire United States rowing um, uh, program, and they were highly respected on campus. So everybody thought I should go up for crew. So the first freshman year, we won one race. That was in Rutgers, and since we lived in New Jersey, it was fairly close to uh, Rutgers, and my mother was there, and we won, but the tradition is the coxswain gets thrown in the water. <laughs> so I hadn't gotten thrown in the water anywhere because we didn't win anything. But this race we won, and two oarsmen grabbed my right leg, two oarsmen my left leg, two oarsmen, there were eight oarsmen, two oarsmen on my right arm, two oarsmen on my left arm, and they swung me out, and as they threw me in the air, my mother said, she screamed, she said, he can't swim, and she fainted. <laughs> the minute she said he can't swim, eight guys jumped in after me. So they hauled me up, and from then on, we had a designated saver that, drove, that jumped in every time we won a race. Then the senior year, we won everything. And so I was being plucked out of the water all the time. The, the main regatta at the end of the year was held in Princeton. And when they threw me in the water in Princeton, both my saver and myself stood up laughing because the water was only up to our knees because it was a, ha it was a man made lake. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, a, it was a wonderful experience. After we won, the event here in Princeton, where all the crews were together, we went to Henley, England uh, to row, and we won our event at the Henley Royal Regatta. So it was a wonderful experience at MIT. Uh, after MIT, I went to Boston University Medical School on scholarship, and during um, my stay at Boston University, I worked three jobs because I was there on scholarship, and uh, my father was in China. My mother was, uh, was uh, selling some Chinese goods in a store in, uh, in uh, New Jersey. So I th worked three jobs. The, for the main job was I worked on a surgical service, uh, the Boston University Surgical Service, and I drew blood on 60 surgical patients every morning at 5 o'clock in the morning. And that gave me room and board, and also uniforms. I picked up white uniforms from the discard laundry bin at the hospital. And um, so I had uh, clothing. I had uh, room and board. They put me in an old TV wing that was no longer being used. And so there was a bunch of us that were, were student phlebotomists uh, that lived in the, uh, in the uh, old TV wards. And then... Um, they, uh, we'd eat uh, lunch at the, uh, at the house staff cafeteria. I worked two other jobs. One was in a private mental um, institution uh, in Boston, and one was at Deaconess Hospital doing lab work. So um, it, was a, uh, it was an interesting experience, and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Following the uh, Boston University, I came to New York to Mount Sinai, and I've been there ever since. So I graduated medical school in 1958, and I came to Sinai, and I, I've been there ever since then. So you uh, started your residency in Sinai. Was there a residency at that time, and how was the GI training? Uh? Well, actually, at that time, I was a rotating intern, and I had decided that I wanted to go into surgery. Uh -huh. So my first rotation was surgery for three months. So I, I went to the ORs, 
and they opened the abdomen and gave me a retractor to hold. So they pumped the table up so the surgeon could see what's happening. I never once saw what happened inside the belly, not once. So I decided surgery isn't for me. If I can't see what's going on in there, I can't do surgery. So I, uh, I then uh, went into, uh, into the uh, GI division and at the time, it was an interesting time in endoscopy. We had one doctor who taught endoscopy on Tuesday, one doctor who taught endoscopy on Thursday. Fiber optics came out, the first low presti Hershkowitz uh, upper intestinal endoscope uh, came out while I was a fellow, and so I did rigid and flexible endoscopy on Tuesday and rigid and flexible endoscopy with a second instructor on Thursday. So when I finished, I had twice as much experience with flexible endoscopy as either of them because I was doing it twice a week, they were doing it once a week. So they asked me to stay on because they thought this flexible endoscopy would just disappear. In fact, fiber optic endoscopy just blossomed and within a few years, they were both gone and I was the new chief of endoscopy. <laughs> so that's how we started. Uh, it was sort of, nobody could teach you how to do flexible endoscopy because there was no precedent for it. Nobody knew how to do it. So we developed techniques and uh, um, methods of, uh, of doing endoscopy and of teaching it. When colonoscopy uh, came into effect, I, um, I learned how to do colonoscopy, but shortly thereafter, ERCP uh, came on the horizon. And no one knew how to do ERCP in New York, it was all coming out of Japan. In fact, um, the, uh, the first Japanese who addressed the um, uh, ASGE um, came to present his findings at the ASGE. And at that time, we were having big questions for upper intestinal endoscopy could the upper intestinal endoscope get into the duodenum or not? And there was a big controversy. Some people said they got in the duodenum, some people say they couldn't get in the duodenum, um, and it was a big controversy. Dr. Um, uh, o came over and he showed ERCP. So for sure he was in the duodenum with ERCP. So people said, how do you get in the duodenum? How did you do that? He said, sometimes I put the scope in the mouth I push it in the stomach, I look, and I'm in the duodenum. <laughs> Everybody fell over at that because it was just a big question. How did you do get in the duodenum? So um, we, uh, I decided I'd go to Japan. So I paid my own way to Japan to learn how to do ERCP. And I learned ERCP, came back, and introduced ERCP to everybody in New York. So. Uh, I trained, uh, I went to different hospitals on Saturday, did ERCP, and showed them how to do ERCP. I was doing colonoscopy and ERCP, but uh, when, uh, when therapeutic ERCP came uh, into uh, existence, because there was none before, I decided I'd concentrate on colonoscopy and uh, leave ERCP to the others. So I'm glad I did that because it was, uh, it was a good choice. When, um, when um, we first started doing colonoscopy, everybody said that it was impossible to push a scope into the colon. You could not get around all the bends of the colon. Uh, so one of the things that happened was uh, Virgin Overholt, mm -hmm. who was a fellow with Marvin Pollard at the University of Michigan, uh, was given the task, Pollard told him he wanted to develop flexible endoscopy for the colon because Pollard had just had a rigid sigmoidoscopy and he hated it. Mm -hmm. So with this flexible endoscopy, he thought that it was a natural for sigmoidoscopy and uh, Overholt decided that he would, and he didn't decide, it was decided that Overholt would develop a colonoscope. And Nobody knew how acute the angulations were in the sigmoid colon, a living person. 
So Gene Overholt gave the patient a latex enema, didn't tell the patient he was going to do it. He put a balloon in the rectum to keep the latex there until it solidified. And when, he, when it solidified, he pulled the latex cast out, and he could actually see the configuration of the sigmoid colon in three dimensions real time. So it turned out that the bending angle of the colonoscope was not very acute. It was a big, wide arc of radius, and it was no way that that could get around all the bends of the sigmoid colon. And besides which, the early colonoscopes only had one way tip deflection. They had one dial that went up and down. So the tip went up and down, but it went up and down in a very wide arc. So he worked hard to develop a sigmoidoscopy, a flexible sigmoidoscopy, which he did develop, and he was the first one to write papers on it. When I developed, when I went into colonoscopy, I, um, I also didn't have any idea uh, how to man manipulate the scope. There was a, uh, a Japanese Olympus representative. The only Olympus representative in the United States was Katsumi Oneida. Mm -hmm. He traveled all over the United States. He would bring in his, in his uh, suitcase um, a colonoscope. He'd leave it with you for a week. He would show you how to do colonoscopy. He was very good. Mm -hmm. He would actually do a colonoscopy He'd say, all right, no, I'm going to leave it here for a week. He'd come back in a week and pick it up, and you were supposed to know how to do colonoscopy by then. So interestingly enough that um, these are the days when we used to watch the instruments with soapy water, clear water, rinse it, and that was it. So when Katsumi Oneida came to pick up the endoscope after a week, he'd take it out of the case and he'd smell it. <laughs> from one end to the other to see if it was clean. <laughs> so my nurse said, she put her hand on her hip, she said, Katsumi, could you pass that test? <laughs> I never saw anybody so embarrassed in my life. So that's the way colonoscopy started, is we just, now, the first time I did a colonoscopy, because the information was that when you did colonoscopy, you had to use fluoroscopy. Well, there were no fluoroscopes that I could use. Every medical ward at that time had a stand-up fluoroscope, so you could see a patient, and if they had a cough, pneumonia, heart disease, you'd put them in front of the fluoroscope, and you'd fluoroscope them and see what their chest was like. But they were all upright fluoroscopes. So I needed a down fluoroscope, and I asked the chief of radiology if I could use the department to you uh, to develop this new instrument. So um, the first case uh, was a Catholic nun. And uh, she was um, well prepared. We used to use castor oil and enemas for mm -hmm. preparation because we had no idea how to prepare a patient. So we asked the surgeons, how do you prepare patients? Two days of a liquid diet, castor oil, and enemas. So that's what we ordered. Now the enemas were triple H enemas. What's triple H enema? Mm -hmm. High, hot, and a hell of a lot. <laughs> so that was our prep, and it was a terrible prep. The, the left colon sometimes wasn't so bad. The right colon was terrible because the enemas just didn't reach up that high. So the first day I did my first colonoscopy in the x-ray department, the senior attendings were there, the chief of radiology were there, the chief of gastroenterology was there, all the fellows were there to watch and see what happened. So after 30 minutes, all the seniors left. After 60 minutes, all of the mid-level faculty left. After two hours, I only had GI fellows in the room. After three hours, I couldn't even find the x-ray technician. He had just gone out. So the next day, the chief of radiology called me in and said, Jerry, I don't think this is going to replace the barium enema. I'm sure it's not going to replace the barium enema. It's too cumbersome. It's too difficult. And you take too long. 
I could have done 10 barium enemas while you were doing this case, so you can't use the division anymore. So I looked around the hospital everywhere to find a fluoroscope that was flat, um, that was a down fluoroscope that I could put the patient on a table. So I finally found one. It was really an old, antiquated fluoroscope. Those days, the fluoroscopic image was so bad that you had to put red glasses on for at least 10 minutes before you would do fluoroscopy because that would adapt your eyes to a dim image and you could see what's happening. So after doing my adaptation, I tried to see where the scope was and if I waved my hand underneath the fluoroscope while, the, while it was active, I couldn't even see my hand. It wouldn't show the bones of my hand, but it would show the scope. So that's what I really wanted. So I did 25, fluoros 25 colonoscopies under fluoroscopy, and I decided that's, that's impossible. We can't do this with fluoroscopy. So I developed all sorts of, of, of identified landmarks and know where we were without fluoroscopy, and that's how non-fluoroscopic colonoscopy first mm -hmm. developed. So there were no guidelines for how to do colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. Nobody had ever done it before. They'd done some in Japan, but so uh, that's how I started colonoscopy. And once I started and I developed these landmarks and the idea of light reflections and how you knew where you were and uh, knowing where the hepatic flexure was and the splenic flexure, then it uh, turns out that everybody wanted to know how to do it. Mm -hmm. So I would be invited everywhere mm -hmm. in the United States, outside the United States, how to do colonoscopy. And that's how the knowledge spread of colonoscopy. And that's how I got to get all over the world mm -hmm. following that black tube that goes <laughs> up the, uh, up the uh, intestinal tract. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, you're part of the early part of the history in, in terms of from rigid to flexible and then figuring out how to go deep into the colon. And uh, tell us about uh, uh, polyps, you know, how polypectomy came into... Well, when, when colon was in, was in its infancy, uh, Hiromi Shinya, in, he came to New York. Hiromi Shinya was a surgeon, Japanese surgeon, whose father was a surgeon in Japan. Mm -hmm. So... His father used his knowledge of endoscopy in Japan because endoscopy was really developed in Japan. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese had the Olympus Company. They would make instruments and uh, they'd use prototypes. So when Hiromi Shinya came here, he brought uh, the knowledge of colonoscopy with him and the fluoroscopy and all that. So he went to Beth Israel Hospital and um, Professor Wolf, uh, who was the chief of surgery, um, encouraged uh, Hiromi Shinya to do colonoscopy. Mm -hmm. So Hiromi did a lot of colonoscopy there, and when they developed the first idea of, of um, polypectomy, as I knew from a long time ago, if you take polyps out, in the United States, it's a surgical procedure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If we did a rigid sigmoidoscopy during my fellowship and saw a polyp, we'd hold the rigid sigmoidoscope there, call a surgeon from the clinic on the phone, he'd come over, put a snare around it, and take it off. Mm -hmm. It was a strictly a surgical procedure. Mm -hmm. So Hiromi Shinya did the first polypectomy, I guess, in the world. So Hiromi knew that he was a surgeon, he did polypectomy, and he developed the technique of making your own wire mm -hmm. and um, taking polyps out with electrical current. Actually, Hiromi did a whole bunch of polyps and he advertised it, but he would never tell anybody how you made the snare. Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. Once again, Katsumi Oneda came mm -hmm. around and Katsumi said, you can get the wire from here, you get the catheters from here, 
and this is how you do it, and Katsumi Oneida let the whole New York area know, and we spread it to the rest of the world, of how you actually made the snare to, uh, to do colonoscopy. We would made our own snares in order to pull on the snare wire. Uh, there was no handle. We would put a hemostat on the, on the wire and hold a, an electrosurgical uh, endpoint which went into a machine or went into a bovi, and we'd hold it by hand onto the hemostat. So if we stand to the foot switch, the power would go through this little connection that we were holding uh, on the hemostat, down the wire, and, uh, and uh, we cauterize the polyp. It turns out that I knew that if I started doing polypectomy, it would be a surgical procedure. I, could, I wouldn't be able to do it more than one or two times at my hospital. So I asked a surgeon, Albert Frankel, who was a colleague of mine and friend, to help me do polypectomy. So Albert Frankel was there for every polypectomy. Now we had no way, we, had, we were using fiber optic instruments where you look through a tiny little mm -hmm. aperture uh, at the end of a fiber optic bundle and it had a lens on it that you could focus on the ends of the of the uh, fiber optic uh, cable but when I was looking nobody else could look so I would take the wire manipulate around the snare around the polyp um, I'd say alright now close the wire so Albert Franco would close the wire and I'd show him briefly what we would what we did so I'd say, and I'd take it back, and I'd say, okay, activate. So he would stand in the foot switch and pull the hemostat so we could uh, cauterize the current. He was more concerned about burning the wall with the wire mm -hmm. than guillotining a polyp. So he would stand in the foot switch and immediately pull the wire like hell. Mm -hmm. So we, we pulled off lots of pops. We avulsed them without current and we used to call it Bloody Friday because mm -hmm. <laughs> we would schedule our polypectomies <laughs> Friday afternoon, Bloody Friday. So that's how polypectomy started in New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, now, of course, we have all sorts of different wires and uh, snares and connectors and lots of different instrument manufacturers are making wires and endoscopic accessories. But uh, it's, it's, it was an interesting beginning mm -hmm. for, uh, for polypectomy. So that's how we started, and everywhere, everybody wanted to know how to do polypectomy, how to do colonoscopy, and since we started early on in my hospital, Mount Sinai, um, I was invited everywhere to do it, and then finally we wrote a book on it. We, David uh, Fleischer, Joe Geenan, and myself wrote books. We each had a chapter. Joe Geenan was cannulation. Uh, I was uh, colonoscopy and David Fleischer was upper intestinal endoscopy. We were using lasers then for stopping bleeding, all sorts of things that were, were cutting edge then, but uh, really wild uh, now. So it's, uh, it was an interesting beginning to, uh, to colonoscopy. When, um, when I um, was chief of endoscopy, we, uh, we used a lot of fluoroscopy for uh, for different things, uh, certainly ERCP was uh, was one of the big uh, areas of fluoroscopy, and uh, we uh, we did not have an end a fluoroscope in the endoscopy unit at all. Mm -hmm. So now lots of endoscopy yeah. units have fluoroscopes, so you can do either dilations, ERCPs, uh, all sorts of uh, therapeutic mm -hmm. activities. But uh, early on, we did not uh, really. And, and none of us had any, any um, training in fluoroscopy. Mm -hmm. Forget that. Mm -hmm. We just stood on that foot switch and watched what happened. It was, uh, it was something else mm -hmm. because we just used the fluoroscope. It's all right. It's, mm -hmm. And uh, now we have uh, different ways of, uh, of doing procedures. Uh, we now have the uh, magnetic imager. But in general, because of the techniques of non-fluoroscopic techniques that we've developed, people don't tend to use either the fluoroscope or 
the magnetic imager mm -hmm. because we now have all sorts of techniques that we've developed in time we don't need those uh, mm -hmm. crutches to help out anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, one thing uh, that I really admire about New York and the GI Society of New York is it's, they do fantastic work. They all get together and put up one of the best courses in the world. Tell me about, you know, you're one of the founding members of the New York Society. Ah. How did you actually come up with the idea? And actually, it's one of the longest uh, serving societies. It's know? over 50 years. Right. Actually, what happened was Dick McRae, who was at St. Luke's Hospital, went to the West Coast, and he attended a meeting of the Regional Endoscopic Society. They don't have regional societies anymore, but there were regional endoscopic societies, and the Southern California Society for Gastrointestinal Endoscopy um, showed them uh, their meetings. So Dick came back and said, we have to form a New York Society. Mm -hmm. So seven of us got together. We had Jim Eddy, who was a surgeon, Paul Sherlock from Memorial Sloan Kettering, Sid Winower from Memorial Sloan Kettering, myself. Um, we had uh, two others, and we actually uh, met at the Yale Club. We had uh, steak and beer. And uh, the society was formed, and within a year, we had our first course, and that was uh, a day in the colon. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were on to teach everybody what to do and how to do it. It was interesting. I had the concept that uh, since the circular muscle is just outside of the mucosa, and if you stretch the mucosa, you could actually stretch it against the circular muscle. And if you saw a... A, an arc of light coming mm -hmm. off of the circular mucosal. Mm -hmm. It was an arc. You know where the lumen was because if you made a circle out of that arc, mm -hmm. the lumen was toward the center of the circle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I talked to that concept because whenever I did colonoscopy, I always had a visitor with me. Mm -hmm. And they would stand on my side and say, how do you know where the lumen goes? Mm -hmm. How do you know it's going this way? So I said, well, it just goes to the left. Well, how do you know it goes to the left? <laughs> and so because of the questions and answers, I developed the technique of looking, of finding these, these various um, signposts that are in the colon. And when I talked, when I gave the lecture on intraluminal signposts at the first colonoscopy course, five guys in the founding group came up to me and said, Jerry, what were you talking about? What is this highlight stuff? So um, it was interesting that we all learned from each other and we, it, the course grew to a, an annual program and now it's the second largest uh, GI course, GI endoscopy course in the United States. DDW was the first and we're the second largest. So it's a... Uh, it's really developed into a wonderful camaraderie, mm -hmm. and um, we have lots and lots of experience. Meanwhile, the Southern California course is just sort of withered away, and they don't have any organization. Right, right. So, Jerry, we made a lot of progress, you know, from screening to detection of early polyps and cancer, and we made one more step that is avoiding surgery and able to take care of these polyps by colonoscopy. Yes. Tell, uh, me about, uh, tell me your thoughts on that. Raju, I see a lot of patients who are sent to surgery for polyps that could readily be removed by an expert in colonoscopy. In fact, I see patients who are referred to surgery because a gastroenterologist finds a polyp that's fairly small but it may be in the ascending colon or cecum, and they can't quite reach it. So they send the patient to surgery instead of sending the patient to another gastroenterologist who could do it. And I see that all the time. Patients are told they need surgery. They hear that from a gastroenterologist, so they go to surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, surgeons usually will do surgery mm -hmm. under those circumstances. Mm -hmm. But my concern is 
that a lot of patients are having unnecessary surgery mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for polyps and lesions that can be taken out readily by an expert. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I would, sub, sub, I would begin a center mm -hmm. for advanced colonoscopy and mm -hmm. therapeutic endoscopy mm -hmm. because not only are patients sent for polyps but sent for common duct stones mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. can easily be mm -hmm. remedied by ERCP. So I decided to set up a center for advanced colonoscopy and therapeutic endoscopy, Sinai. Mm -hmm. And the acronym is CACTES, C-A-C-T-E-S, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Advanced Colonoscopy and Therapeutic Endoscopy, Sinai. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, we can get the information out not only to local physicians, mm -hmm. but to patients. Mm -hmm. I think that's where the focus has to be. Mm -hmm. The patients these days mm -hmm. are very internet savvy. Mm -hmm. Everybody mm -hmm. looks me up before mm -hmm. they come. Mm -hmm. Everybody now is able to access the internet. And I think that w with the ability to peruse various options, mm -hmm. patients will be better off mm -hmm. if they can find a place where they may have a second opinion mm -hmm. that's, that may take the place of them going under surgery and having a right hemicolectomy mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. sigmoid resection. Mm -hmm. It'd be much better off for patients mm -hmm. and much better off for, uh, for doctors. Mm -hmm. So we started the uh, center and uh, it's now um, growing at Mount Sinai we just hired a research coordinator, mm -hmm. so we're at the beginning of an appeal to local physicians mm -hmm. and patients mm -hmm. that may be able to learn more about what is out there mm -hmm. and what we can do mm -hmm. to prevent the patient from having unnecessary surgery. Mm -hmm. Sometimes surgery is necessary, mm -hmm. that's okay, mm -hmm. but I'm concerned about unnecessary surgery. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting, uh, you know, I was listening to Mike Sivak's uh, interview for Video GIE, the Meet the Master Series, and uh, uh, he mentions the best single device ever developed for endoscopy is a snare. Is a snare. Right. And uh, that brings us to this question, you know, uh, you are part of the group that uh, uh, brought colon cancer screening to the forefront and you are part of the group that started the National Polyp Study. Tell us about how you actually thought about it as a group and how you implemented it, because whatever we do now, it dates back to that original thinking. Yes, um, we didn't know what to do with colon polyps. We didn't know how long colon polyps could dwell in the colon. We thought they probably had some relationship to colon cancer, but we didn't know anything about colon polyps, how rapidly they, they, uh, they appeared. And I wrote a paper saying that if you do a colonoscopy and take out colon polyps, and you do another colonoscopy a year later, you often find another polyp. So, of course, it meant that you had to do a colonoscopy every year. So I said in my paper, you have to do a colonoscopy every year. Sid Winover was... Um, was given the opportunity to develop a program for looking at colon polyps. It was funded by ASGE, AGA, and uh, American College of Gastroenterology. So Sid got a whole bunch of us together. He had uh, radiologists, pathologists, uh, oncologists, gastroenterologists, and he got us together in a small hotel near LaGuardia Airport. Everybody flew in. Uh, we had uh, Joe Geenan from Milwaukee, uh, Jay Panish and Mel Shapiro from California. We had, so the whole United States was represented with their own team. So mm -hmm. there were pathologists, radiologists, gastroenterologists came to this meeting. Sid proposed that we do a randomized clinical trial each person would have their own coordinator 
paid for by the grant. So a coordinator would be locus would be embedded into the endoscopy unit, and everybody who had a colon pop removed would be invited to join this randomized clinical trial. Now the randomization was to come back in one year or three years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I heard that I thought he was nuts. Mm -hmm. I thought I've I've never heard anything so preposterous. Mm -hmm. How could you do three years <laughs> for colon polyps? Mm -hmm. So. I agreed to join, and it turns out that my office, since I did a lot of colonoscopy, was the single biggest contributor to the National POP study. But, so, we had a coordinator who would talk to patients, invite them to join, tell them what it was all about, and we randomized patients to one to three years, and it turns out that when they looked at the statistics, it didn't make any difference if you saw them in one year or three years. Uh, so. We took, we adapted the three-year follow-up, and after that, it went to a five-year follow-up. And now, the uh, the um, consensus is that if you don't find anything in the colon, you can let the patient go for ten years for the next uh, examination. So that's how the whole national POP study got off the ground, and uh, it was an interesting study. We've had lots of papers in the New England Journal of Medicine, AGA, gastrointestinal endoscopy, and uh, we, we got off the ground with the uh, National Polyp Study. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that I really wanted to do was come and listen to your Friday morning uh, meeting. And uh, I've heard from a lot of fellows who you know, had the opportunity to train with you that every Friday you came up with a case or a video. And you had a, lo a lot of interest in recording from early on. Uh, we would like to hear your thoughts on, you know, how you recorded, you know, from its infancy, from a five millimeter film or a one millimeter film to now, and how do you keep track of things to teach people? Well, that, that was an interesting consideration. Um, the first examination that we used to do when we had the gastro camera for the stomach was there was an instrument before we had vision through the instrument. You could put, um, you could actually uh, see what was happening by taking a picture inside. Mm -hmm. So we'd put down a scope, no fiber optics, but a flexible instrument into the stomach. At the tip of the instrument mm -hmm. was a tiny little metal tip in which we'd put a tiny little cassette, mm -hmm. a five millimeter film strip mm -hmm. with 20, 20 uh, exposures in the uh, small cylinder. So we'd screw it on, hook it on a, to a little cable, and put this thing in the stomach, mm -hmm. which was of course dark. Mm -hmm. We'd push a button, and the film would advance five millimeters. The five millimeter film would advance five millimeters. We'd hit another button and a light would go on at the end, the incandescent light would go on at the end of the scope and it would expose the stomach but also expose the film because mm -hmm. the film didn't have any, uh, any aperture. It was just wide open, just exposed by one flash of light. There was a very specific sequence that you had to do once you inflated with a rubber bulb, you inflated mm -hmm. air into the, uh, into the stomach, and it was a very specific sequence you had to follow in order to see all the walls of the stomach. Mm -hmm. So we would do this, and we'd send the film off to Olympus. Mm -hmm. They'd send it back, and every Friday morning, my fellows and I would sit beside this little tiny projector mm -hmm. on a small screen this big, to mm -hmm. see what was in the stomach. Mm -hmm. the, so we did it every Friday, and after a while, surgeons began to realize that we were seeing things in the stomach that mm -hmm. they couldn't see on x-ray. Mm -hmm. So we had radiologists, pathologists came to see, surgeons, gastroenterologists, and now we have a large Friday morning meeting every Friday in which we show not, not film strips anymore, but show videos. Mm -hmm. So we show videos of colon polyps and colon cancer, 
upper intestinal endoscopy, Barrett's esophagus, ulcers. So uh, it, it uh, developed into a, uh, a regular uh, weekly conference that, uh, that's sort of unstructured. Anybody can say anything they wanted mm -hmm. and say, well, I saw 10 of these and I, I think this is what it is. So um, it was, it's an interesting conference now and it's gotten to be a, a regular running conference that people enjoy coming to and in fact, I was running the conference Friday morning. GI Grand Rounds were Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And at GI Grand Rounds, maybe there were 10 people. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was terrible, GI Grand Rounds. It was 5 o'clock in the afternoon. People wouldn't come. Or they were busy. But my conference, Friday morning, was always packed. Mm -hmm. So David Sacker, the chief of gastroenterology, said, Jerry, do you mind if we move... GI Grand Rounds to follow your conference mm -hmm. so that we'd have an audience. <laughs> and so now my conference is early in the morning, immediately followed by GI Grand Rounds so that we have an audience for GI Grand Rounds. Mm -hmm. So coming to this, uh, you know, you had one of the busiest practices in New York, probably the busiest uh, colonoscopy practice. And while taking care of so many people in New York, you also served as a president of ASGE, ACG, and World Endoscopy. How did you manage that? Um, it was nice in private practice. I could really do whatever I wanted. And I was invited to lots of places. And although my private practice suffered, I could do, do my schedule the way I wanted to do it. So when if I went, if I were invited to go to Germany to do a live demonstration, I've done live demonstrations everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. but if I were invited to go to Germany for live demonstrations, I'd fly in on, uh, on a Wednesday afternoon after, after I did finish my cases, do cases Thursday and Friday, come back Saturday, and be ready for practice on Monday again. So I'd maybe miss two days so that's the way I travel. It's, uh, I just go for a day or two, do the conference, and come back. So it was not such a big problem because I could schedule my cases the way I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've seen uh, medicine and endoscopy evolve over the last 50 years, more than 50 years, and, uh, and also the changes in the healthcare and the pressures now. So if, if I were to come and ask your advice as a fellow, uh, how to train, how to balance my life, and how to be productive and also serve the community, what's your advice? Um, that's a tough question, Raju, but the problem is that when I go around to lots of endoscopy units and do cases in different countries, I found that the teaching of endoscopy was really terrible. Mm -hmm. And if you're taught bad endoscopy, you do bad endoscopy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people didn't know how to teach. Mm -hmm. So when I was president of uh, the uh, World Endoscopy Organization, the one thing I wanted to do, and I saw the one area that was lacking in education was teaching endoscopy. Mm -hmm. So I developed this program for endoscopic teachers mm -hmm. called the Program for Endoscopic Teaching, PET. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. PET program mm -hmm. is now part of the World Endoscopy Organization. And interestingly enough, not ASGE, not ESGE, no endoscopic societies ever considered a program for teachers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They considered lots of other things, mm -hmm. looking at ulcers, looking at disinfection, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not anything about teaching. Mm -hmm. So the World Endoscopy Organization has really jumped into this um, avidly and is now running these programs for endoscopic teachers. How you should teach, what you should teach, the curriculum, um, and now that's a, a big um, part of the teaching program. But if I were to tell a young person, 
in a GI program, I would say that endoscopy is not gastroenterology. Endoscopy is fun, it's interesting, it's exciting, but along with learning endoscopy, you have to learn the rest of things. You have to learn pancreatitis, cholangitis, Barrett's esophagus, what to do about it, how to approach the patient in a fully GI program rather than just focusing on endoscopy. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot more to gastroenterology than endoscopy, and that tends to get lost because everybody wants to do endoscopy and spend their time there. But I think it's very important to be an endoscopist. You have to know other diseases, how to approach them, how to treat them, how to diagnose them, and you can only do that by learning the full context of gastroenterology, not just endoscopy. First of all, I want to thank you, and uh, I want to share a story. Uh, this almost going back to 30 years, before internet. I first came to know about you while I was in India, after just finishing my <laughs> Uh, GI fellowship. So one of my close friends, uh, Siva Prasad, is a good friend of Ajay. So he came after finishing his GI fellowship to see you at Mount Sinai uh, 30 years ago. Wow. And he brought a photograph of you in Mount Sinai. And he told me what a fun time he had. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And uh, I've seen many photographs in my life. But that photograph is still very fresh in my mind, even today. That photograph it's is still marvelous. very fresh. And I can't imagine that, you know, 30 years later I'll be sitting with you. Thank you, Raju. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're my hero. Thank you.